way of background, uh, she is a professor in neurology in the Feinberg School of Medicine. She is a director of the Center for Circadian and Sleep Medicine, which was the first of its kind uh, in the world and in the United States. She also serves as the chief in the, uh, of the Division of Sleep Medicine and Neurology at Northwestern University, has authored over 300 peer-reviewed publications, and is focused on basic and translational sleep and circadian rhythm research. A uh, few past accolades and, and present accolades, she has served as president of the Sleep Research Society, as well as chair of the NIH Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board, and has previously been awarded the American Academy of Neurology Sleep Science Award, as well as the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's Academic Honorary Award, as well as the William C. Dement uh, Academic Achievement Award. She is renowned for the work in this area that she'll be presenting uh, to us today, and we're very fortunate to be having Dr. Z uh, for this Grand Rounds talk focused on circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders. And Dr. Z, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, Michael, very much for inviting me and for this uh, very kind introduction. So um, what Dr. Awa thought would be interesting to this audience would be more of a clinical approach um, to diagnosis and management of some of the circadian rhythm sleep disorders. We won't have time to really go through all of them, but I think at least some of the common ones that you may encounter in, in your practice. So one of the... Let me see if I can move this ahead. It's very clear that one of the most prominent changes that we experience on a daily basis is really the rotation of the Earth on its axis. And thus, this really prominent light and dark cycles. But also with that comes these behavioral cycles and physiological cycles when you're awake, when you're, there's light, you know, there's physical activity. And also, of course, when in the dark, when there's, you know, there's going to be sleep and also rest. And, and, and there are many disorders that do not align well with this natural rotation of, of the Earth on its axis. And where circadian rhythms come into is that these intrinsic endogenous rhythms are in every cell and probably uh, perhaps most of the molecular mechanisms in our, in our body. And they need to be, all of them endogenously generated at a molecular level, they need to be in sync with that of this rotation of the Earth on its axis, like dark cycles, social behavioral cycles that we experience. And some of our sleep disorders really arise from this misalignment. As this is a review, all of you know that there's two major conceptual processes that regulate sleep and wakefulness. The first is the homeostatic drive or the sleep homeostasis that really builds up as a function of wakefulness. And there are substrates, for example, adenosine or CREB. Uh, many of these are either inflammatory, immune, and or metabolic factors that build up in the body as well as in, in the neurons and in the brain. But then needs to dissipate during the sleep period. But also in opposition during the day to this buildup of the homeostatic need is a circadian system. So the circadian clock not only provides uh, timing information, but it also provides when it's firing an alerting signal during the day. So this alerting signal kind of counteracts this propensity for sleep that occurs during the day as the buildup of sleep homeostasis. And then at night, uh, from a signal from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, melatonin gets secreted from the pineal gland. And the, time, and the timing of melatonin is indicated by this red arrow. It's what we call dim light melatonin onset. So it only goes up in dim light or darkness. So bright light will suppress the onset of melatonin. And it's thought that when melatonin gets secreted, it decreases the firing rate of these um, neurons in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And hence now circadian alertness is very low and homeostatic drive for sleep is very high. And thus, this ability to consolidate sleep into that seven to eight hour period during the night. So here's that SVN cycling on its own as an endogenous rhythm. And there are endogenous clocks, not only in the suprachiasmatic nucleus here, but really in every, almost every tissue, every cell of your body, this molecular mechanism for which the Nobel Prize was given in 2017 is inherent in all of these um, 
other tissues. But because most of the human circadian rhythms are not exactly 24 hours, we tend to run about 24.2 hours, that means that it needs to be in sync and tree to this rotation of the Earth, the light dark cycle. Um, and therefore, light is the strongest time giver or zygaber. And it is so important that the circadian system in, has its own photoreceptors and that is located in the renal ganglion cells and contains melanopsin, so, and which is most sensitive to the blue or short wavelength light that some of you may have heard about blue lights and, and why they may be more effective for the circadian system. This entrainment then goes on to entrain all these clocks in the brain, in all of the regions of the brain, and then also through the autonomic nervous system, sending these signals to all these peripheral tissues to keep them in sync with this beautiful orchestra. But in addition to that, of course, we know that there's melatonin that's been secreted. That can also change the timing of the circadian clock as well as social and physical activity can be weak time movers for the circadian system. And more recently, there's been a lot of interest in food and trainable oscillators and how we can use food and timing of food to also kind of stabilize entrainment of these circadian rhythms. So food not does, does not directly affect the central clock here in the SCN, but rather is a strong time giver to the peripheral clocks because it's metabolic, right? Metabolic clocks, which exist in really nearly all of these tissues. So we can use kind of both central and peripheral uh, tools or zygabers, time givers, to provide the synchronization between central peripheral rhythms, central rhythms, peripheral rhythms with the external light dark cycle and social and physical activities. But as I said a lot earlier, light is really one of the most potent time givers. Melatonin, yes, to some extent, but not as strong of a time giver. So it's important to understand the phase response curve to light and to melatonin when we talk about tools that we use to treat or phase shift these uh, circadian rhythms. So here's let's say, an example of the temperature rhythm. And here is T-man or, or, or the, the lowest part of the temperature rhythm in a human. This would be about three or four o'clock in the morning. And you can see that if you give light here, here in the evening part, late evening, nighttime, you will then delay circadian rhythms. Whereas if you give light here in this kind of early morning Hour, you will advance the timing of circadian rhythms. This is crucial to how light will work. And oftentimes we miss it because we don't realize that it's really so well time based. The same thing would be for melatonin, which is the dark signal. So let's say you give melatonin here in the evening or right before bedtime, what will it do? It will actually advance circadian rhythms, whereas Melatonin here during the early morning hours will delay circadian rhythm. So using these two, these two tools, we can actually shift clinically and entrain these circadian rhythms that may be mismatched. So what I'd like to talk first about the classical circadian rhythm sleep wake disorders. And that is how circadian rhythm disorders have classically been known in sleep medicine. It's about sleep and wake timing. But as I told you a little bit earlier, it's much more than that, right? Much more than that. But let's just think about that for, for a while. It is still correct, but I'll show you maybe a little bit later how we are now thinking that these clocks play a much broader role in local function at the tissue level, and therefore has broad implications beyond sleep and wake regulation to the health and disease of many uh, common disorders like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, um, et cetera. So here are the circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders. Classically, uh, the most common ones are going to be delayed sleep-based wake disorder, which I'll talk about, a bit about non-24-hour, incited people as well as blind people, irregular sleep-wake disorders, which is found mainly in older adults, especially those with uh, neurodegeneration like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And then just briefly talk about 
written uh, shift work, uh, just very, very briefly. But these are these all assume that sleep is normal and that the only problem is that the timing of sleep and wake are at a wrong time of the day. So let's um, talk about a little bit about that. So it's really clinical diagnosis, but how do you know that somebody who says, I can't fall asleep, but they have a circadian disorder versus, or they wake up too early versus somebody that may have a, you know, chronic insomnia as a disorder. So really important in the strategy is to identify what time is it in the body, right? How do we do that clinically? You know, one of those hands of the clock, we can look at the timing of melatonin onset or dim light melatonin onset. We can look at actigraphy. There's, there are many biomarkers, but is that, it, that is not actually required in the ICSD3 for the diagnosis. But I would argue that it's something that we should be thinking about because about 50% of the most common circadian disorder, which is delayed sleep phase weight disorder, are not circadian based. They may be sleeping late and waking up late, but their dim by melatonin onset, which is a marker of circadian timing, is actually well within normal range. So you may be treating a circadian disorder based on circadian principles, and yet it may be behaviorally induced and you need actually behavior strategies. So what kind of clinical measures do we have in the clinic? I think anyone who has difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, we should get a chronotype questionnaire. My favorite is the Munich chronotype questionnaire, which you can see right here. It's, it's free, it's available, and it asks about sleep timing. When is the timing? When is the best time for sleep? And it gives then the, creates a situation where you are either an evening type or morning type uh, or a neither type. So almost every patient with a circadian disorder is going to have uh, a face disorder. It's going to be a morning type or an evening type, right? So I think that gives you a bit of a clue. You can do sleep diaries like you see here. You can see this, this beautiful sleeping wake patterns across many, many days. You can do actigraphy. There's a CPT code in the United States for actigraphy. So you can actually bill for actigraphy. You may not get reimbursed, but you can actually bill for actigraphy. Uh, and we usually do this for seven days to about 14 days in, in our clinic. You can also do dim light melatonin onset or DLMO by using salivary melatonin. I can show you how we do this. Um, not, we don't do this in the clinic. We actually do this. We send it out to our patients and they do it at home. Almost all of these are done at home. But if we don't have any of these, which is the majority of many of our sleep centers, then what we can do is just use the diary. So there are these common relationships. This is a diary, and the orange is where the person is, their sleep period, onset and offset. And in the green arrow, uh, you will see this is the nadir, the lowest point of the core body temperature occurs about two to three hours before somebody wakes up. If you look at when melatonin normally goes up without even measuring it, it would be about two to three hours before an individual falls asleep. Not when they go to bed, but when they fall asleep. So if you know that, you can kind of guesstimate where those phase markers are, are going to be. In addition, another really neat one is the midpoint of sleep. That's just the midway point. Somebody goes to bed at midnight, wakes up at 8 o'clock, midpoint is 4 a.m. Those individuals with midpoints of sleep later than 4 o'clock in the morning, maybe 5 o'clock in the morning, or those earlier than 2 o'clock in the morning are going to have a circadian phase issue. Late would be 5 a.m. or later, and early advanced sleep phase people would have probably a midpoint of sleep about 2 a.m. or earlier. So you can see that you can really assess circadian timing even with something, something as simple as a sleep diary. Um, I'm not going to go through this too much, but this is the type of thing that we do when we do salivary home melatonin assessments. We ask people to stay in dim light conditions because that was otherwise light was suppressed melatonin. We saw about five to six hours before they normally would be falling asleep. And we ask them to basically 
put a little cotton ball underneath their, their, in their mouth and they soak it and they put it back into these little salivates. They freeze that and they send it either back to us or to a company, usually to a company that will then do the assay for us. And then we will get these beautiful samples. And I'll show you just a little bit of what we end up getting. So let's put this into practice. Um, so here's case number one. This is a 61-year-old um, male with difficulty falling asleep. Uh, bedtime is about 10 p.m. Falls asleep, I'm sorry, difficulty staying asleep, sorry. Uh, falls asleep pretty easily, sometimes even earlier by 9 p.m. Wakes up at 2.30 in the morning, is unable to fall back to sleep. Falling asleep at work tired uh, and tried everything, but nothing seems to work. He's even tried Zolpidem CR uh, for sleep maintenance, feels depressed, but not on any medications. So I would argue, is this somebody who has sleep maintenance insomnia? Sounds like it, right? Early morning awakening, maybe even depression. So how would we know? Well, this is his melatonin. This is a salivary melatonin. And this is picograms over here in the y-axis. And his, you can see, is rising at about 6 p.m. That's pretty early. In a normal phase person, it should be about 9 or 10 p.m., right? So doesn't have chronic insomnia. This person may have chronic insomnia, but this person has circadian advanced sleep wake phase disorder as the basis for his insomnia-like symptoms. So the treatment for advanced sleep wake phase uh, hasn't changed very much uh, since basically um, probably in 2017, there's, there was a, some, a revisit of this, but since then it hasn't changed very much and nor has really the diagnostic criteria. There will be this year, a new uh, ICSD-4 now, I think, uh, that will be forthcoming very soon. But so far, it's really, you know, it's it's all clinical. It's advanced in the major phase of the, of the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, symptoms are present for these three months. When allowed to sleep, when they desire to sleep, sleep is relatively normal. And it does ask that keep sleep logs. It's important at least for seven days, maybe preferably longer. And um, use standardized ground type questionnaires, as we already discussed. And if you so wish to do something like dim light melatonin, also, but it's not required. But I can show, I, I think I've convinced you that it can be useful under certain circumstances. The treatment for this individual, if you look at the ASM treatment guidelines, which I would have to say are not very helpful at all. So maybe you shouldn't even really look at them all that carefully. They're not. It's the task force suggests that clinicians treat adults with ASWPD patients with evening light versus no treatment, but it's very weak for that, that the evidence is very weak for that. What do we do clinically? We use evening bright light, as the ASM kind of suggests to some extent, about 4,000 lux or 1,000 lux, or it really will vary, maybe even 10,000 lux, for anywhere from half an hour to about two hours prior to habitual bedtime. So if, if their bedtime is 9 p.m., like in our patient, we give the light around 6 to 8 p.m. And theoretically, if we wish, low dose melatonin after early morning awakening. But I typically don't do that because melatonin itself at that early morning hour can make cause drowsiness and sleepiness and could be an issue for especially an older adult who may be waking up early and still have the somnolence associated with melatonin. So this is our patient. So we did a actigraphy, right? And so now you can see that um, in this individual, um, having some, this person was waking up fairly, you know, um, early. So their average bedtime was about 10. Uh, I have to move my a little bit off so I can actually see. Dr. Z, a couple of folks have mentioned in the chat, sorry to interrupt, yeah. they were having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. And I know that everyone's oh, really? very eager to hear what you have to say. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Is it possible to change the microphone to your headset microphone and see if that makes sense? Oh, help? I'm sorry. I did not know that I had no that. Problem. No problem. That's what I meant to do. Uh, that's what I meant to do. So let's change that to um, audio. Yeah, you're doing it. It's not a light. Okay, this should be a lot better. Uh, I think uh, everyone will be very pleased to be able to. I am so sorry. You should have interrupted no, me earlier. No problem at all. No problem at all. I'm so sorry. So here is an actigraphy, which is really kind of uh, interesting because this yellow stuff is light data. So most of our watches now that you can buy have light sensors on them. And the, the wiggly, the, the black uh, space here, the, the lines here is activity uh, levels. And in this blue aqua area is where we think based on either the diary and or the, the, the little timer here, you can see this little, this little blip here where the individual says, this is my bedtime, right? And so this would be the sleep period. So you can see this individual on average is this is 6 a.m. is waking up around four o'clock or so and going to bed probably around 10 p.m., right? And wake time is... So what we did before, remember our patient was waking up at 2.30 in the morning. So just by virtue of using that light there about seven, about seven to 8 p.m., we're able to delay his bedtime to about 10 p.m. and more importantly, his wake time to 4.30 to 5 a.m. So that was just after you know three weeks of this therapy. And eventually we're gonna move it even later because if the impatient desires to wake up at six, we'll continue to move it later. So that means that we'll keep that light on, but not now at 6, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., but maybe more like seven or 8 p.m. so that we can further delay his uh, circadian rhythm. Uh, now I have to move this forward a little bit more. Uh, a case number two is a 41-year-old woman who initially presented at the age of 25 with complaints of insomnia and daytime sleepiness. Has seen several sleep physicians with an unclear ideology. PSGs, we all do PSGs, right? PSGs uh, show frequent leg movements, but no evidence of OSA. They did a multiple sleep latency test because um, she was so sleepy. And it did show 5.3 minutes as her sleep latency. But of course, we have no idea when uh, it actually started. Remember, she, she, I mean, did it start how many hours after she naturally woke up? But fortunately, there were no storms. So she was diagnosed as having potentially possible narcolepsy and started her on modafinil without a significant improvement. They thought maybe she may be delayed as well. And they gave her five milligrams of melatonin between nine and 10 p.m. and kind of just use some light in the morning, uh, kind of more vague instructions. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't work uh, very well. So this is her sleep and wake diary. It may seem a little strange to you the way it looks right now, but it's just double plotted. That means we took the 24 hour and we plotted it in the 48 hours. So this is exactly the same as here, just so that we can see this middle period. Okay, so it's just double plotted. So this is her usual, most of the time, she appears to be you know, sleeping late, right? Going to bed, you know, three o'clock in the morning and waking up sometime around noon time. But then, uh, but her desired wake time, a sleep time and wake time is at midnight and waking up at eight o'clock uh, in the morning. That's in the blue. But notice something weird here. So here, sometime in the afternoon, right? She is also taking long naps, you know, two, three hour naps sometime here in the afternoon. So we thought, okay, this is behavior. I mean, this is insomnia behaviorally induced because She's taking naps here and that's gonna decrease her homeostatic drive for sleep. So we said, okay, what you're gonna to have to do is stop this napping behavior and we're gonna work on consolidating your sleep. So that was the first thing that we did. We did actigraphy as well, 
<clears throat> and this is her actigraphy record. And here again, we can see that she's going to sleep around midnight, waking up around you know, eight o'clock or so. And we thought, hey, we cured her uh, by just doing, preventing her from napping and consolidating her sleep. And then we realized that she was, we set the watch to Chicago time, but she actually lives in Israel. So actually she was going to bed at 5.30 in the morning, falling asleep and waking up much, much later. And when we looked at her melatonin onset, you can see here what happened. It's two, almost two o'clock in the morning. So that makes sense, right? She's falling asleep at five in the morning and her melatonin is going up of two or three hours before falling asleep time, which is about two o'clock in the morning. And as you know, it should be sometime between nine and 10 p.m. Very different than our other uh, patient. So she has delayed sleep-wake face disorder. Again, the ASM treatment guidelines say that, uh, suggest that clinicians, um, treat delayed sleep weight phase disorder with and without depression with strategically timed melatonin versus no treatment. Again, the evidence was weak for that. And in children um, and adolescents with delayed sleep phase weight disorder uh, with strategically timed melatonin versus no treatment. So the, the, only, the only recommendation was to use melatonin and not light. But we know light is very powerful. So in clinical practice, what we do is we indeed, we can use melatonin, a low dose, not one milligram, not three milligrams or 10 milligrams, but half a milligram about five hours prior to bedtime. Not at nine o'clock in the evening, not at 10 necessarily, or before bedtime, which is what most people um, do or tell their patients to do. We also avoid bright light prior to bedtime because we don't want that light to be delaying their circadian rhythms further. And also we uh, use bright light therapy anywhere to about 5,000 lux for about 30 minutes to two hours, depending upon awakening. So this would be a signal to advance circadian rhythm. So everything we're doing is to advance the timing of circadian rhythms. So that's exactly what we recommended for this particular patient. We did bright light for one hour on awakening, starting by 11 a.m. So she, she probably wasn't waking up until maybe noon or one or 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And slowly we advanced by 30 minutes every one to two weeks, the timing of the light uh, as, as much as she could, as, as long as she was waking up earlier and earlier uh, every week by about 30 minutes. We did uh, start a dim light, um, basically saying you need to turn down your lights about nine, uh, starting about nine to 10 p.m. Try to get her in bed about one o'clock in the morning and 0.5 milligrams of melatonin around 11 p.m. Okay, so that would be about five to six hours before when she normally would be falling, when she actually was falling asleep at the time, which is about five o'clock uh, in the morning. And then we gradually advanced both the light and the melatonin timing until we achieved the desired you know, uh, sleep and wake um, schedule. So she wrote back to us uh, and said, I wanted to tell you about a miracle that happened three days ago. I opened my eyes and looked at the clock. It was eight o'clock in the morning. The sky was blue and I was wide awake. I got out of bed, had breakfast with my partner and children, went out and had a wonderful day. The miracle was that after 20 years of always being tired or worse, sleeping the whole day, I was wide awake and able to do what everybody else does. So we, you know, she, she, she lives in Israel. She found us, she actually traveled to see us here at Northwestern, but we didn't realize that she was actually very wealthy. So she gave a gift to Northwestern and to really study to Dr. Abbott and I to study the pathobiology and physiology of delayed sleep phase. And we're actually doing phase response curves and so forth. So, and indeed, if you look at the evidence in the literature, I'm, there is evidence that melatonin can work. And this is why the, the ASM uh, recommended that as weak evidence. And if you can do all that circadian stuff, the only thing that would be what you can do is use a low dose melatonin 
Ask your patient, when do they normally fall asleep? If they say two o'clock in the morning, then what you would want to do and say, but when do you actually want to fall asleep? And they say midnight. Great. Then just give them melatonin about an hour or two hours early than midnight. So that ends up being about 10 p.m. Okay, this is what the study did. And it showed that not only did it improve the alignment or circadian phase, but also improve sleep quality via the PROMISE um, sleep quality uh, questionnaires. Increased total sleep time as well and time to fall asleep. And this was only for four weeks, right? Uh, over five continuous days. So to summarize, for advanced sleep phase, you wanna give light here in the mid or late evening hours, avoid bright light in the morning. So when this individual wakes up, uh, and it's three or four o'clock in the morning to be in dim light conditions rather than bright light conditions. For delayed sleep phase, on the other hand, you want to avoid bright light in the evening. You want to enhance bright light in the morning shortly after awakening. And also you have the option of using melatonin, low dose melatonin in the evening, usually for most individuals would be about 9 p.m., uh, 8 to 9 p.m. So another case, 34-year-old male with periodic insomnia and daytime sleepiness. He's always been an evening type, uh, always had difficulty falling asleep before one or two o'clock in the morning. Over the past three years, um, sleep and wake times are drifting later and later by almost an hour per day. He was no longer able to work because he was unable to even predict when he would be awake to be able to go to work. These patients tend to be very um, obsessed with keeping their sleep logs and diaries. This is way before he came to see us. And this is on a daily basis. So what you notice is that this is all, most of his adult life has been like this. So he, he goes to bed very late. He goes to bed around, you know, falls about two, uh, about one, uh, one or 2 a.m., right? And then on a couple of days during the week, he goes, he falls asleep much, much later by about three or four hours later, and then sleeps in very, very late. Do you see that? So overall, this looks like somebody with delayed sleep phase, wake disorder, very typical. They, you know, they, they have jet, social jet lag uh, on the weekends. But when he came to see us, this was his sleep-wake cycle. This is day after day after day. He's drifting, he's getting later and later every day. Sometimes he's sleeping 10 hours. Sometimes he's only getting about four hours of sleep uh, or less. So we diagnosed him. He was sighted. He did not have visual uh, problems. We uh, did diagnosed him with non-24 hour sleep wake rhythm disorder. And we treated him as if, you know, the, 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 the treatment protocols for somebody who would be blind, who has no light perception, but he has light perception. We let his rhythm drift to a desired time where he close to a desired uh, fall asleep time or bedtime. So let's say when it got close to about eight or 9 p.m. Then we start a very low dose melatonin, half a milligram of melatonin about an hour before bedtime. Remember now his, this person's bedtime is about you know, nine, eight or 9 p.m. So we could, we're gonna stop this drift, right? With this melatonin, we're gonna do entrainment. We're not shifting them like we did with the delayed sleep phase. We're causing entrainment. We're locking, locking this rhythm in. And because this person is sighted, we also gave him bright light therapy every morning upon awakening. Well, he comes back with a sleep diary. This is before treatment. This is during our treatment. Here's the light therapy in the morning in the yellow. Here is the uh, melatonin here. I think it's in the green, which he hasn't taken very much. Sometimes he took it here, took it here, took it here. But you can see he's continued to drift, right? To delay, but, much, but a little bit better 
than when you saw when he first came in, he was just going you know, really, really rapidly delayed. So we said, hey, I think it looks good. We're, we're getting somewhere. And he says, no, I really hate it. Um, it really feels like my body has three different schedules now. My physical self seems to be better because I'm sleeping at a more normal time right here before, you know, he's waking up sometime before uh, noon and he's not like going across the entire 24 hours, but I feel like my, my metabolism and I'm still mentally highly nocturnal. So we said, well, what could be going on here? So we did a food diary. I've never done food diaries in my circadian clinic until this patient, this in this patient. So I said, what, what, what could be going on? When are you eating? Look what he's doing. Although he's sleeping at a more regular time, he is still eating only at night, nocturnally. He consumed 3,000 some calories between 0130, right? And then and it's always nocturnal. And then the next day he says, I'm not even gonna eat very much because, right? Because he just ate. And then the next day uh, in three hours, he consumed 3000 calories all at night. So we said, aha, what should we do? We said, he, he didn't like the bright light therapy. I mean, he didn't like bright lights at all. It gave him migraines. So we just gave him melatonin, right, again. Uh, an hour, one to two hours before bedtime, and we gave him meal timing. So we, we said, okay, you, you cannot eat within three hours of bedtime, and you're going to eat regular time. So we use meal timing as a peripheral clock Zygaber, okay? And that allowed him, look, at, this is his diary now. This is pretty, pretty, I mean, in my opinion, very uh, impressive that now he's been able to do that. We've not seen him since um, then. So I think he either must be doing very well or very poorly. So um, I'm gonna go and talk about this, why pay so much attention to light. This is work done by our group showing that it is, it is not the visual pathway that is important for circadian entrainment of light. It is this retinal ganglion cells that contain melanopsin and they go directly to the SCN through the retinal hypothalamic tract and then entraining the rest of the, um, of the areas of the brain and also down into, into nucleus. So with delayed sleep phase, it could be that they're just not getting enough light in the, uh, they're getting too much light in the evening and not getting enough light in the morning, right? Because that's what our treatments are doing, de decreasing the amount of light in the evening and increasing the amount of light uh, in the morning. So that, that's clearly possibility. But what about sensitivity? Maybe they're getting enough light, but they're less sensitive to light as a pathophysiological mechanism. And indeed, uh, the Australian group has shown that when they did light exposure in people with delayed sleep phase compared to controls, that they were in the evening, they were more sensitive to light. They had larger phase shifts. So they had larger delay shifts for evening light. So smaller amounts of evening light in, in those patients would actually cause larger phase shifts than in a normal group. And this is true for melatonin suppression. They were able to suppress more melatonin than the control group for the same amount of light. And even the pupils constricted more in the evening than those of the controls. However, we go on to show, uh, we do pupillometry in, in, in our uh, clinic for these types of patients as well. And what we show is the, uh, the opposite, but that is in the morning, during the day, the same delayed sleep phase patients have less sensitivity to light in the morning. So they need more morning light and less evening light. Okay, so it's both issues. So there's something uh, abnormal about their retinal ganglion cells, about their melanopsin system. So it's not just their behavior, so forth. So we, we actually show this. And in our non-24 hour patient, they're the ones who are the most affected. They are the least sensitive to this blue green light uh, in the morning. So now we're using pupillometry as a diagnostic tool because you know it's really hard, right, to do melatonin uh, assays and so forth. So we're we're really trying to develop this as a diagnostic uh, tool. 
So uh, I think with we're running a bit out of time. So finally, I think we're just going to talk about this case. This is a 77-year-old man with cognitive impairment and Parkinson's disease. Over the past five months, sleep has been really problematic. He falls asleep easily and sleeps for a few hours on and off throughout the entire night, but also he falls asleep during the day. He, uh, he no longer sleeps on the second floor. He sleeps in the guest bedroom on the first floor because he has fallen while walking down the stairs at night. Uh, he, he goes to bed pretty early, 8.30 to 10 p.m., wakes up at 5.30 in the morning. At least he is woken up at 5.30 in the morning. He usually falls asleep very quickly. And then he's up and down every two to three hours for the remainder of, of the night. He snores loudly even during naps. So we consider the possibility, of course, of sleep apnea. So these are all in the differential diagnosis of this patient. Maybe he's got a parasomnia. He's got REM behavior disorder. Uh, he could have circadian rhythm disorder. He could have you know, insomnia, hypersomnia, or OSA. This is his sleep-wake diary. Uh, again, the, this, this little part is when he is asleep. What does it look like? It's just everywhere. Although he may be sleeping mostly during the night, uh, he's taking a lot of naps during the day uh, as well. So I think this looks more like a irregular sleep-wake rhythm disorder because most patients with insomnia actually don't nap <laughs> during the day. They're hyperactive, hyper aroused. This is the actigraphy, how it can be quite useful. You can see the naps here in the red arrows and you can see how much activity there is, number of awakenings during the night, and also kind of the fragmentation of sleep and wake across 24 hours. So it is, it is a difficult condition uh, to treat the irregular sleep-wake rhythm disorder. And I would say here, the practice parameters are quite right on top of it, that you know, they do recommend a mixed modality approach, including enhancing light throughout the day, increasing activity levels and social constraints and scheduling during the day, and other behavior treatments. And so I would say that that's, and melatonin actually probably does not have much of a role in the treatment of these patients. So it's really light during the day and kind of increasing their homeostatic drive during, during the night. And uh, I think just maintaining a more regular sleep and wake schedule. Uh, I'm, I think I'm gonna, I, I, Maybe I can just talk quickly about, this is the last one. This is a 55-year-old female with excessive sleepiness for about a year. She works at a casino from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. for about five years, has a 30 to 35 minute commute in which she drives. Bedtime is 9 a.m., falls asleep right away. This is on her work days, right? When she's working nights and wakes up two to three hours later Sleep is fitful until she gets out of bed about 3.30. So this is on the days that she works. This is her actigraphy. You can see the light again here during the day. And she's active here, more light. She takes a little nap here. You can see no activity here, no activity here. Again, this is double plotted. And no, so this is her major sleep period. So these two days are when she works the night shift, okay? So she gets very little sleep during here in this morning period when she's home right here between nine and maybe about one or two o'clock in the afternoon. This is her, her off day <laughs> when she is not working nights. She falls asleep around 10 p.m. and stays asleep until about eight or nine. <laughs> She sleeps for 12 hours. Again, working nights, three nights, three days, and then a recovery day. So that tells me already that she is not adjusted, right? Her circadian rhythm is not even after five years is not adjusted to a night shift worker. And night shift workers have a lot of issues. Not only uh, are their circadian rhythms misaligned, 
but their sleep pressure is very high because they can't sleep during the day because of their circadian misalignment. That's why she was always recovering, right? Her sleep during you know, the days that she had off. So the sleep pressure is very high. And, but the circadian system is misaligned. So what happens is that even if your sleep pressure is very high, you can't sleep at the wrong circadian time. So these individuals are misaligned and chronically sleep deprived. And as you well know, uh, that both of these conditions increase cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease risk, and also the use of substances, whether hypnotic medications and or stimulant medications uh, to stay awake. So what we did for her was, this is her diary. What we did for her was, we said, when you come home from, from, from work, put on some sunglasses so that you can prevent too much bright light on your way home. Because what that will do, that light in the morning is one, is gonna, we want her to delay, you know, we want her to delay her sleep-wake cycle. This will advance her sleep-wake timing. We also said, when you do wake up, you know, get bright light throughout the rest of the day until you have to go to work. And also at work, right? Because she works in a casino, it's gonna be bright lights anyways. And melatonin here before bedtime. And scheduling her bedtime at nine o'clock in the morning, and waking up about three or four o'clock in the morning. So this is what this is what happened. So she was still waking up a little bit here, in the, but so much better. And then on weekends, we said, or not weekends, but when she's not working, we said, go to bed about three o'clock in the morning so you can spend time with your family, with your uh, partner. Uh, but then wake up, let, tell, your, tell your family to allow you to stay asleep until about noontime. So what we have done is that we did not shift her back to a normal daytime person. We put her in a compromised phase position here. So instead of moving her all the way from Chicago to Paris, we kept her rhythm on her non-work days, more like in Greenland or Iceland so that when she goes back to work, she doesn't have to shift that many more hours. And when she is off work, she doesn't have to shift that many more hours. And she, she, you know, she did uh, fairly well with that. It's not perfect, but it's something that would be doable. So this is our circadian medicine clinic. It's, uh, as Dr. Awad uh, mentioned, is one of the first in the, in the country. We do sleep diaries, we do dim light melatonin onsets, and we also do genetic analysis uh, of our patients with a genetic bank uh, right now. And we also do pupillometry to really uh, arrive at a personalized circadian time to really assess circadian timing more accurately, uh, as accurately uh, as, as possible. And finally, this is our circadian medicine clinic. As you notice, it's, um, it's a, there's our sleep clinic and we have a circadian medicine clinic that is separate from the sleep clinic um, itself. That took, it is much, much harder to do that from a hospital standpoint. That took the longest amount of time to actually get a plaque up that actually would separate these two than anything that I've actually had to do in my, in my life. So, um, and really beyond all of these sleep-wake disorders is the implications of circadian disorders for really way beyond in neurological disorders. It is a risk for Alzheimer's disease, risk for cancer, a risk for cardiovascular metabolic disorders. We've done a lot of work with diabetes uh, as well. It's almost everything that you look at, circadian misalignment appears to be a risk factor for this, especially those who are more later phase uh, individuals. And, uh, and so we are at Northwestern working very, um, actively in various areas where Alzheimer's, type two diabetes, uh, ICU delirium, the role of uh, circadian dysregulation in the ICU, uh, et cetera. And these are uh, some of our collaborators and junior faculty basically, and mid and level senior faculty who have contributed to this really amazing amount of, of work. So I'm gonna stop here um, and leave at least 10 minutes for questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Z, for a, a wonderful talk as usual. I've heard you speak many times, and every time I leave more amazed with the scale and level of research and commitment that you are bringing back to this important field. So uh, with that, I uh, will just open up for three or four questions. If you could please feel free to unmute your mics and even turn on your videos so we can have a collaborative discussion. Uh, I see from Dr. Neil Craig, uh, who's a, a sleep neurologist in Ontario. Um, he is saying, thank you for a wonderful talk. Two questions. Uh, number one, do you use less than one milligram of melatonin for all CRSWD? And number two, uh, thoughts on chronotherapy, progressive delay of sleep for delayed sleep phase. Yeah, so let me address that first one, uh, the second one first. The, the problem with chronotherapy is not that it doesn't work and it could potentially work. Uh, and by delaying somebody's rhythm uh, or sleep-wake timing every day by let's say an hour or so across the cycle, um, also requires that you keep that individual in very controlled light dark cycles. Because remember, light is really strong. You go out there and at the wrong time of the day, that light will shift your rhythm. The other um, downside for chronotherapy is um, that some of these delayed people can, uh, can become non-24 hour, just like our patient, because now you're pushing it later uh, and later. So we don't usually do that, um, except in the, those who are behaviorally delayed, right? That chronotherapy may be to some, I mean, that we don't delay them even further. What we then do is really what we call behavioral chronotherapy, which is to really keep them under more regular conditions and, and really enforce earlier uh, bedtimes. I think there's, a, and then the question was about melatonin, right? The low yeah. dose melatonin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, in my practice, whether it's advanced delayed or non 24 hour, I hardly ever use high dose melatonin. The most I would probably use is one milligram, maybe three milligrams. And, but to shift the clock, I only use half a milligram. So, because you can give the half a milligram at, you know, in the evening and it won't make you sleepy necessarily. Sometimes in some of my patients, I will also give them a higher dose melatonin before bedtime for its sleep inducing effects. And for those individuals who have advanced sleep phase, I've also rather than giving them melatonin in the middle of the night or early morning, I've given them a slow release formulation of melatonin so that they will have melatonin. They don't need melatonin when they go to bed, but they will need that melatonin in the early morning hours. So that melatonin will be a signal to delay their circadian rhythms and maybe allow them to stay asleep longer. So I don't only, only use low dose melatonin. I usually use like three milligrams of a, or one and a half to three milligrams of a slow release formulation. I see one question that's uh, being discussed frequently in practice. I, I know many of us, um, you know, more general sleep specialists will recommend bright light therapy, but we'll often leave it up to the patient to go and find the specific light box. And often they'll end up on Amazon and find something that is, you know, 10,000 lux, for example. Is there a specific light therapy box that you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I, I was just, uh, I, I think I need to say this because I forgot to say it is that when I say lux, it is just a measure of, of intensity and it's not overhead. We're looking actually lux at the, at the, at the eye level. Now lux, it's not in itself that is as important as perhaps um, the quality of light, okay? And now more and more we're talking about EDIs means equivalent daylight. You want the light to look like daylight, like sunlight, because light is not just intensity. It also has colors and it also has temperature. So you, and, and we know that that's going to be important. So now there are a lot of light bulbs out there. There are a lot of these um, light boxes that will emit kind of more enriched in the short wavelength, right? Blue or green enriched. And things that say equivalent daylight, right? Or, or similar to sunlight. I think that that's what you want. And with that type of light, you can actually get to a lower intensity and be effective. 
which will be easier for older people who may have difficulty tolerating, for example, uh, very, very bright lights. The, um, I like uh, glasses actually more than perhaps even the, um, the, the light boxes because you can move around with them. I mean, imagine sitting, you already are late for work and I'm telling you, you're a late person, sit in front of this light box for another 30 minutes or an hour, now you have to wake up even earlier. It's compliance is, is an issue with that. So there are now uh, various uh, light goggles that people can use. Uh, there's two that I, three that I can think of that we all, that we recommend. One is, one the brand is called AO. Um, I think that's uh, European. Uh, and it does give this blue and rich light. It's a goggle, looks very cool, for where it's even smaller than my glasses. The, the other one is Lumiet. Uh, and I think that's, um, I don't think it's a Canadian company, but um, I think it's, it's again, a European company, very similar. Um, the Lumiet, you probably won't be able to use glasses with it. Whereas the AOs, you can use glasses with it. And then the last one is a green, green light. And it's called Retimer, R-E hyphen timer. So those are the goggles. But if you're gonna use light boxes, what I would recommend is just buying some lamps, you know, that are cheap and then buy these, these beautiful, these GE or any type of light bulbs that are, that are a daylight equivalent light bulbs and then light up your room with that because it's, just looking at a light is not the best thing. It's really that diffuse light that, that actually would be, be perhaps the best. So I, that's what I tell my patients, you know, just go and get that, um, buy some light bulbs. And I've written, believe it or not, I've written letters, uh, medical letters of necessity for people to buy light bulbs, okay? Uh, because they cost about 40, $50, some of those, so that they can buy a bunch of them and, and just, you know, they can't even do their overhead. It's just so much simpler. And many of those are LED, so they're actually not that expensive either. Thank you for that. Uh, there is one last question here from Dr. Jennifer Hirsch, who's from the University of Toronto. She said, thank you for the lecture. Can you speak to this overall success rate in treating delayed sleep-wake phase disorder with this routine or melatonin and light? And if it doesn't work, what is sort of your plan yeah. B next step? The, the success is very high initially, you know, if they, if they're compliant and they do it, it actually does work. However, maintaining this type of treatment is really the challenge in, in, you know, in our field. And I, we tell our patients that they know best when they're drifting back and when they're drifting back, don't drift all the way. You know, the signs of that start your therapy again for maybe two or three or four weeks or, or, or a month and then live your life and, and that they need to protect that light at night, right? And also get as much light as possible going outdoors. They don't necessarily have to be wearing these glasses you know, every day. That seems to work for most of our, our, our patients. However, uh, they do fall back. And I would say, you know, I sometimes I don't see these patients for years, sometimes two, and then voila, they're back on my list, right? Uh, because something happened, they traveled, or they got, you know, something in their life happened, and they got off. So it is, it is, it is a difficult uh, thing. So what if it doesn't work? Uh, I would then actually look and see why is it, I, I would do, let's make sure that we look at other rhythms, right? Let's look at their meal timing. What are they doing with that? What is their ex their physical activity level doing? So then I would start using these peripheral clocks, peripheral you know, time givers, whether it's feeding, whether it's exercise, et cetera, together with light and trying to further enhance um, that, that, you know, that, that rhythm. Also, we're looking at psychiatric disorders. I think those are common in this population that may also be an issue in treating that. One of the things that makes it difficult to treat these patients is that they have this tremendous amount of sleep inertia. They can't wake up in the morning and they're sleepy you know, during the day. And sometimes uh, I have used, at least temporarily, a stimulant medication 
to allow them to stay awake, to build that homeostatic drive. Because during the process of any treatment that you're doing from a circadian standpoint, initially you're sleep depriving them a little bit, okay? Because you're trying to keep them in this very tight schedule, you're going to end up sleep depriving them a little bit. So that's, and I find that after usually something like modafinil, that may be, you know, that, that has been shown to be helpful um, in, in some of our patients on the short term. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, it looks like that's all of the questions that we have today. And we thank you so much for your time, Dr. Z. We appreciate it on behalf of all of us, uh, both from at, within Peak Sleep and the other sleep specialists from across Ontario have joined us today. Thank you so much for your time. Great, great pleasure to be there. Thank you. Great seeing some of you friends and colleagues. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>